Welcome to the Thousand Nights and One Night. Now, when it was the two hundred and sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Kamar al-Zaman acquainted the Lady Bador with what he had seen in his dream, she and he went in to her sire, and telling him what had passed, besought his leave to travel. He gave the prince the permission he sought, but the princess said, O oh, my father, I cannot bear to be parted from him. Quoth Gaer, her sire, then go thou with him, and gave her leave to be absent a whole twelve month, and afterwards to visit him in every year once. So she kissed his hand, and Kamar al-Zaman did the like. Thereupon King Gaer proceeded to equip his daughter and her bridegroom for the journey, and furnished them with outfit and appointments for the march and brought out of his stable horses marked with his own brand, blood dromedaries which can journey ten days without water, and prepared a litter for his daughter, besides loading mules and camels with victuals. Moreover, he gave them slaves and eunuchs to serve them all the manner of traveling gear, and on the day of departure, when King Gair took leave of Kamar al-Zaman, he bestowed on him ten splendid suits of gold cloth, embroidered with stones of price together with ten riding horses and ten she camels and a treasury of money and he charged him to love and cherish his daughter the lady Bador. then the king accompanied them to the farthest limits of his islands where going in to, to his daughter Bador and the litter he kissed her and strained her to his bosom weeping and repeating o thou wooest severance easy fair for love embrace belongs to lover friend. Bear softly. Fortune's nature falsehood is, and parting shall love's ever meeting end. Then leaving his daughter, he went to her husband and bade him farewell, and kissed him, after which he parted from them, and giving the orders for the march, he returned to his capital with his troops. The prince and the princess and their suite fared on without stopping through the first day and the second and the third and the fourth nor did they cease faring for a whole month till they came to a spacious campaign abounding in pasturage where they pitched their tents they ate they drank they rested and the princess Bador lay down to sleep presently kamar al zaman went into her and found her lying asleep clad in a shift of apricot colored silk that showed all and everything and on her head was a coif of gold cloth embroidered with pearls and jewels the breeze raised her shift which lay bare her navel and showed her breasts and displayed a stomacher whiter than snow each one on whose dimples would contain an ounce of benzoin ointment at this sight his love and his longing redoubled and he began reciting and word asked me when by hellfire burnt when flames of heart my vitals hold in him which wouldst thou choose sayest wouldst thou rather them or drink sweet cooling draught i'd answer them then he put his hand to the band of her petticoat trousers and drew it and loosed it for his soul lusted after her when he saw a jewel red as dye wood made fast to the band he untied it and examined it, and seeing two lines of writing graven thereon, and a character not to be read, marveled and said in his mind, hmm, Were not this bezel something to her very dear? She had not bound it to her trousers band, nor hidden it in the most privy and precious place about a person, that she might not be parted from it. But I knew what she doth with this, and what is the secret that is in it. So saying, he took it, and went outside the tent to look at it in the light. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. And now, when it was the two hundred and seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when he took the bezel to look at it in the light, the wily was holding it, behold, a bird swooped down on him, and snatching the same in his hand, flew off with it, and then lighted on the ground. Thereupon Kamar al-Zaman, fearing to lose the jewel, ran after the bird, but it flew on before him, keeping just out of his reach, and ceased not to draw him from dale to dale, and from hill to hill, 
till the night darkened and the firmament darkened when it roosted on a high tree. So Kamar al Zaman stopped under the tree, confounded in thought and faint for famine and fatigue, and giving himself up for lost, would have turned back but knew not the way whereby he came, for that darkness had overtaken him. Then he exclaimed, There is no majesty and there is no might save in Allah, the glorious, the great and laying him down under the tree whereon was the bird, slept till the morning, when he awoke, and he saw the bird also wake up and fly away. He arose and walked after it, and it flew on little by little before him, after the measure of his faring, at which he smiled and said, By Allah, a strange thing! Yesterday this blue bird flew before me as fast as I could run, and today, knowing that I have awoke tired and cannot run, flieth after the measure of my faring. By Allah, this is wonderful. But I must needs follow this bird, whether it lead me or death or to life, and I will go wherever it goeth. For at all events, it will not abide safe in some inhabited land. So he continued to follow the bird, which roosted every night upon a tree, and he ceased not pursuing it for the space of ten days feeding on the fruits of the earth and drinking of its waters. At the end of this time, he came in sight of an inhabited city, whereupon the bird darted off like the glance of the eye, and entering the town, disappeared from Kamar al-Zaman, who knew not what it meant, or whither it was gone. So he marveled at this and exclaimed, Praise be to all who hath brought me in safety to this city. Then he sat down by the stream and washed his hands and feet and face and rested a while. And recalling his late easy and pleasant life of union with his beloved, and constraining it with his present plight of trouble and fatigue and distress and strangerhood and famine and severance, the tears, the tears streamed from his eyes, and he began repeating these synclaims. Fain, and I hid thy hand work, but it showed. Change sleep for wake, and wake with me abode. When thou didst spurn my heart, I cried aloud, Fate! Hold thy hand, and cease to gird and gold, and dole and danger, I my sprite I spy. And but the Lord of love were just to me, sleep for my eyelids, nez, were forced to flee. Pity, my lady, one for love owed thee, from this tribe's darling brought to low degree. Love come, and doomed wealth beggar death to die. The railers chide at thee, I ne'er gainsay, but stop my ears, and doubly sign them nay. Thou lovest a slender may, say they, I say. I picked her out and cast the rest away. Enough! When fate descends, she blinds man's eye. And as soon as he had finished his poetry and had taken his rest, he rose and walked on little by little till he entered the city. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased saying her permitted say. She said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that as soon as Kamar al Zaman had finished his poetry and had taken his rest, he arose and entered the city gate, not knowing whether he should wend. He crossed the city from end to end, entering by the land gate, and ceased not faring on till he came out at the sea gate, for the city stood on the seashore. Yet he met not a single one of its citizens. And after issuing from the land gate, he fared forwards, and ceased not faring till he found himself among the orchards and gardens of the place, and passing among the trees, presently came to a garden, and stopped before its door. Whereupon the keeper came out to him and saluted him. The prince returned his greeting, and the gardener bade him welcome, saying, Praise be Allah, that thou hast come off safe from the dwellers of this city. Quick, come into the garth, ere any of the town folk see thee. Thereupon Kamar al-Zaman entered the garden, wondering in mind, and asked the keeper, What may be the history of the people of this city, and who may they be? The other answered, Know that the people of this city are all Magians. But Allah upon thee, tell me how thou camest to this city, and what caused thy coming to our capital. Accordingly, Kamar al-Zaman told the gardener all that had befallen him from beginning to end, Whereat he marveled with great marvel and said, No, O my son, the, the cities of Al-Islam lie far from us, 
and between us and them is a four months voyage by sea and a 12 months journey by land. We have a ship which saileth each year with merchandise to the nearest Moslem country and which entereth the seas of the Ebony Islands and thence maketh the Kalidian Islands the dominions of King Shahraman. Thereupon Kamar al-Zaman considered a while and concluded that he not do better than to abide in the garden with the gardener and become his assistant, receiving for pay forth of the produce. So he said to him, Wilt thou take me into thy service to help thee in this garden? Answered the gardener, Do here is to consent, and began teaching him to lead the water to the roots of the trees. So Kamar al-Zaman abode with him, watering the trees and hoeing up the weeds and wearing a short blue frock which reached to his knees. And he wept floods of tears, for he had no rest day or night by reason of his strangerhood. And he ceased not to repeat verses upon his beloved, amongst others, the following couplets. Ye promised us, and will ye not keep plight? Ye said a say, and shall not deed be dight? We wake for passion while ye slumber and sleep. Watchers and wakers claim not equal right. We vowed to keep our loves in secrecy, but spake the meddler, and you spoke forthright. O oh, friend in pain and pleasure, joy and grief, in all case you, you only claim my sprite. Midfolk is one who holds my prisoned heart. Would he but show some ruth for me to sight? Not every eye like mine is wounded sore, not every heart like mine, love pine and blight. Ye wrought me, saying, Love is wrong as I. Yea, ye were right. Events have proved that quite forget they one love thralled, whose faith the world robs not, though burn the fires and heart alight. If and my foeman shall become my judge, whom shall I sue to remedy this despite? Had not I need of love, nor love had sought, my heart for sure were not this love distraught. Such was the case with Kamar al Zaman. But as regards his wife, the Lady Badur, when she awoke, she sought her husband and found him not. Then she saw her petticoat trousers undone, for the band had been loosed and the bezel lost. Whereupon she said to herself, By Allah, this is strange. Where is my husband? It would seem as if he had taken the talisman and gone away, knowing not the secret which is within it. But to heaven I knew whether can he have wended. But it must needs have been some extraordinary matter that drew him away, for he cannot brook to leave me by a moment. I'll curse the stone and damn its hour. Then she considered a while and said in her mind, If I go out and tell the varlets and let them learn that my husband is lost, they will lust after him. There is no help for it, but I use some strategy. So she rose and donned some of her husband's clothes and riding boots and a turban like his drawing one corner of it across her face for a mouth veil. Then setting a slave girl in her litter, she went forth from the tent and called to the pages who brought her Kamar al Zaman's steed. And she mounted and bade them load the beasts and resume the march. So they bound on the burdens and departed, and she concealed her trick, none doubting that she was Kamar al Zaman, for she favored him in face and form. Nor did she cease journeying, she and her sweet days and nights, till they came in sight of a city overlooking the salt sea, where they pitched their tents without the walls and halted to rest. The princess asked the name of the town and was told, it's called the city of Ebony. Its king is named Armanus, and he hath a daughter, Hayat al-Nufus, Hayat. And Shasharzad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased to say her permitted say. Now, when it was the two hundred and ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the Lady Badur halted within sight of the ebony city to take her rest, King Armaeus sent a messenger to learn what king it was who had encamped without his capital. So the messenger coming to the tents made inquire and at their king, and was told that he was a king's son who had lost the way being bound for the Calidian Islands, whereupon he returned to King Ar Armanus, with the tidings, and when the king heard him, he straightway rode out with the lords of his land to greet the stranger in arrival. 
As she drew near the tents, the Lady Bredore came to meet him on foot, whereupon the king alighted, and they saluted each other. Then he took her to the city, and bringing her up to the palace, bade them spread the tables and trays of food, and commanded them to, to transport her company and baggage to the guest house. So they abode there three days, at the end of which time the king came to the Lady Bredore. Now she had that day gone to the hammock, and her face shone as the moon and its full a seduction to the world and a rending of the veil of shame to mankind and armanus found her clad in a suit of silk embroidered with gold and jewels so he said to her o oh, my son know that i am a very old man decrepit withal and allah hath blessed me with no child save one daughter who resembleth thee in beauty and grace and i am now waxed unfit for the conduct of the state she is thine, O my son, and if this my land please thee, and thou be willing to abide and make thy home here, I will marry thee to her, and give thee my kingdom, and so be at rest. When Princess Badur heard this, she bowed her head, and her forehead sweated for shame, and she said to herself, How shall I do this, and I a woman? If I refuse and depart from him, I cannot be safe, but that happily he sent after me troops to slay me. And if I consent, belike, I shall be put to shame. I have lost my beloved, Kumar al-Zaman, and know not what has become of him. Nor can I escape from this scrape, save by holding my peace, and consenting and abiding here, till Allah bring what is to be. So she raised her head, and made submission to King Armanus, saying, Hearkening and obedience. Whereat he rejoined, and rejoiced, and bade the herald make proclamation throughout the Ebony Islands to hold high festival, and decorate the houses. Then he assembled his chamberlains and nabobs, and emirs and wazirs, and his officers of state, and the kazis of the city, and formally abdicating his sultanate, endowed Badur therewith, and invested her in all the vestments of royalty. The emirs and grandees went into her, and did her homage, nothing doubting but that she was a young man, and all who looked on her be pissed their bag trousers for the excess of her beauty and loveliness. Then after the Lady Badur had been made sultan, and the drums had been beaten in announcement of the glad event, and she had been ceremoniously enthroned, King Armenus proceeded to equip his daughter, Hayat al-Nufus, for marriage, and in a few days they brought the Lady Badur into her, when they seemed as it were two moons risen at one time, or two suns in conjunction. So they entered the bridal chamber, and the doors were shut and the curtains let down upon them, after the attendants had lighted the wax candles, and spread for them the carpet bed. When Badur found herself alone with the princess Hyatt al-Nufus, she called to mind her beloved Kumar al-Zaman, and grief was sore upon her. So she wept for his absence and estrangement, and began repeating, O ye who fled and left my heart in pain, though lean, no breath of life is found within this frame of mine. I have an eye which e'en complains of wake, but lo, tears accompany it. Would that wake content these eyes? After ye march forth, the lover bowed behind. Question of him what pains your absence could design. But for the flood of tears, mine eyelids rail and rain. My fires would flame on high in every land Calcine. To Allah. Make a moan of loved ones lost for I, who for my pine and pain no more shall pain and pine. I never wronged them save that over love I nursed, that love departs as lovers and blessed and cursed. And when she had finished her repeating, the Lady Badur sat down beside the Princess Hyatt on the Nufus and kissed her on the mouth, after which, rising abruptly, she made the minor abulation and betook herself to her devotions. Nor did she leave praying till Hyatt al-Nufus fell asleep, when she slipped into bed and lay with her back to her till morning. And when day had broke, the king and queen came into their daughter and asked her how she did. For part she told them what she had seen and repeated them the verses she had heard. Thus far concerning Hyatt al-Nufus and her father, but as regards Queen Budur, she went forth and seated herself upon the royal throne and all the emirs and captains and officers of state came up to her and wished her joy of the kingship, kissing the earth before her and calling down blessings upon her. 
and she accosted them with smiling face and clad them in robes of honor, augmenting the fiefs of the high officials and giving largesse to the levies. Wherefore all the people loved her and offered up prayers for the long endurance of her reign, doubting not but that she was a man. And she ceased not sitting all day in the hall of audience, bidding and forbidding, dispensing justice, releasing prisoners, and remitting the customs due till nightfall, when she withdrew to the apartment prepared for her. Here she found Hyatt Al-Nufus seated. So she da sat down by her side, and clapping her on the back, coaxed and caressed her, and kissed her between the eyes, and fell to versifying in these couplets. What secret kept I these my tears have told, and my waste body must my love unfold? Though hid my pine, my plight on parting day, to every envious eye my secret sold. O oh, ye who broke my camp, you've left behind, my spirit wearied and my heart a cold. In my heart's core ye dwell, and now these eyes roll blood drops with the tears they will on roll. The absent will I ransom with my soul. All can my yearning for their sight behold. Have an eye whose babe for love of thee rejected sleep, nor hath its tears controlled. The foe then bids me patient bear his loss. Ne'er may mine eyes accept the roof he doled. I twitch them dim of me and won my wish of Kamar al Zaman's joys manifold. He joins all perfect gifts like none before. Boasted each might and main, no king of old. Sing his gifts, bin Zadaz Lajis. Forget we, and Muyawa, moldest, mildest soul. Were verse not feeble, and or short the time, I had in laud of him used all of rhyme. Then Queen Bedour stood up and wiped away her tears, making the lesser abulation, applied her prayer, nor did she give over prayers till drowsiness overcame the Lady Hyatt al Nufus, and she slept, whereupon the Lady Bedour came and lay by her till morning. At daybreak she arose and prayed the dawn prayer, and presently seated herself on the royal throne, and passed the day in ordering and counter-ordering, and giving laws and administering justice. This is how it fared with her. But as regards King Armenus, he went in to his daughter and asked her how she did. So he told her all that had befallen her and repeated to him the verses which Queen Bedour had recited, adding, O oh, my father, never saw I one more abounding in sound, sense, and modesty than my husband, save that he doth nothing but weep and sigh. He answered, O oh, my daughter, have patience with him yet this third night, and if he go not in unto thee and do away thy maidenhead, we shall know how to proceed with him, and oust him from the throne, and banish him the country. And on this wise he agreed with his daughter what course he would take. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. And so do I cease my tale for the day, until it be morrow.